Let's continue now in our worship with the first reading. It comes from the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 16, verses 14 to 23. Listen now for God's word for us today. Now the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. And Saul's servants said to him, See now, an evil spirit from God is tormenting you. Let our Lord command the servants who attend you to look for someone who is skillful in playing the lyre. And when the evil spirit from God is upon you, he will play it, and you will feel better. So Saul said to his servants, Provide for me someone who can play well, and bring him to me. Then one of the young men answered, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who is skillful in playing, a man of valor, a warrior, prudent in speech, and a man of good presence. And the Lord is with him. So Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, Send me your son David, who is with the sheep. Jesse took a donkey loaded with bread, a skin of wine, and a kid, and sent them by his son David to Saul. And David came to Saul and entered his service. And Saul loved him greatly and made him his armor bearer. Saul sent, David, Saul sent to Jesse, saying, Let David remain in my service, for he has found favor in my sight. And whenever the evil spirit from God came upon Saul, David took the lyre and played it with his hand. And Saul would be relieved and feel better, and the evil spirit would depart from him. Listen now to this gospel reading from Luke chapter 10, verses 33 to 35. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. And then he put the man on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, this last weekend, I was in a place called McAllen, Texas, attending a conference called Philosophy Across the Americas, Thinking the Borderlands. And it was appropriate for this conference to be in McAllen because McAllen is as far south as you can go in Texas and still be in Texas. It's really more North Mexico than anything. The town sits right on the Rio Grande River, and since 2014, there has been a tremendous spike in the number of undocumented immigrants who have come through this community in Texas. As part of the conference, our group of about 20 people, we went to the border wall that's there in McAllen, and uh, we listened to the story of one of the people in the town who was trying to address these large numbers of undocumented immigrants who are coming through the city. Her name was Sister Norma Pimentel, and she told us the story of how she founded the Humanitarian Respite Center there. She said that in those early days, what the Border Patrol would do was they would pick up these undocumented immigrants, they would round them up, get their information, take their fingerprints, give them a court order to appear in an immigration court, and then put them on a bus to the McAllen bus station. And so this bus station was filled with people every day. Desperate people who had walked through the heat of the desert, temperatures above 100 degrees. It was 95 degrees there when I was there. And these people would come with nothing, just the clothes on their backs, escaping poverty, violence, broken families, coming from the Northern Triangle, Guatemala, Costa Rica, from Mexico, even from Eastern Europe and China. 
people from all over the world crammed into this bus station with nowhere to go. And Sister Norma, she wanted to do something about it. So she asked the local priest in town if she could borrow his parish hall just for a little while to, to have a place where people could come and get a change of clothes, have a meal, take a shower. Well, three years later, over 20,000 people have been served by this humanitarian respite center, and uh, the priest still hasn't gotten his parish hall back. <laughs> That's probably okay. The day that she came to speak to us, 65 people showed up at the center. Now, Sister Norma was not an imposing figure, but she was striking. Short in stature, quiet in tone, there was a understated compassion in her voice. She told us a story about going to the immigration detention facility one day. She said there they had packed over a thousand children under the age of 10 into this small room that was really made to only hold about 300 people. She says it was like a kid aquarium because there was a big glass window that the border patrol agents would stand behind it and to monitor the, the detainees. And when Sister Norma got there and saw these children, she asked them if she could go in and they told her, no, you can't go in. But she said, I want to pray with them. And no one's going to turn away a nun who wants to pray. She went inside and it was, it was freezing in there. The kids called the facility La Hielera, the cooler. And they were all packed in there together, most without clean clothes or shoes. And Sister Norma stood in the midst of them as they're crying out for her to take them with her. And she prayed with them. And they cried and she cried. And when she was done praying, as she was leaving, one of the Border Patrol guards stopped her and said, thank you. She said, for what? And he said, for showing us that they are human. Now, Sister Norma has done a lot for the people who have been coming through McAllen, Texas. She has housed them and advocated for them, but that story, I think, demonstrated how she used this talent she had, this gift of prayer, to unlock the door to that facility, to go in and minister to those children, and then to unlock the heart of that Border Patrol agent. To see these children as children, and not just as illegals. Sister Norma told us another story that I want to share with you. She told an old story. It's, it's an apocryphal one. It may or may not be true. It's about an advertising executive named David Ogilvy, who was one of the original Mad Men in New York in the 1960s and 70s. One day, this man, David Ogilvy, was passing a man begging on the street, and the man had a sign hanging around his neck. It said, I'm blind. Please help. Well, Ogilvy went to the man, and he told him what he did for a living, and he asked, Can I write something on your sign? The man said, Sure, why not? So Ogilvy changed the sign, and when he came back at the end of the day, the beggar's cup was overflowing with money. And the blind man, incredulous at how successful his day had been, asked Ogilvy, What, what did you write? Well, what he had written was, It is spring, and I am blind. Please help. Ogilvy had turned the man's simple statement, I am blind, into a story. It's a beautiful spring day. There are flowers, there are trees, birds, and I can't see any of it. Help me. And people understood the pain of that story. And so they gave. It was just four little words. It is spring and. But it made all the difference. And why? Because they were carefully chosen by a talented marketer. Someone who knew how to turn a statement into a story and a message into something that meant something to people. He had a talent for words. 
So what is this talent? Where does it come from? If you look up talent in the dictionary, it'll say that a talent is an innate or natural ability. It's anything, really. Talent for singing, for dancing, for mathematics, for storytelling, for patience, for caring. Talents are predispositions, ways that we can act with grace and skill when it comes to certain tasks. Talents can't be learned, of course. They can't be taught. They just are there. And that can seem a bit unfair at times. Sometimes when you're trying to learn a new instrument and you just don't feel like you're getting it, that can be a little trying. But the provision of talents is only unfair if we forget where these talents are coming from. They're not the result of our genes or our nature. Rather, as with all of creation, our talents are gifts from God. The theologian John Calvin once wrote that God has appointed tasks for everyone, their own particular ways of life, and no task will be so sordid and base that it will not shine and be reckoned very precious in God's sight. What Calvin's describing here is the deep meaning of the word talent in the Christian faith. That it's related to our sense of vocation or our calling with God. Our talents are an expression of this vocation, of God's calling in our lives, provided in advance by God just as much as our faith is provided by God. Whatever your talents may be, however base they may seem, if God has given them, Calvin teaches us, they are indeed very precious in God's sight. All those things were so given to us by the kindness of God, Calvin goes on to say, so destined for our benefit that they are entrusted to us, and we must render an account of them. We're reminded here that these talents are precious, that they're something we hold in trust. Just like our time, just like our treasure, our talents are something that we must be good stewards of, that we must render account of how we use them when the Master returns in judgment. The great preacher Frederick Beekner once noted that stewardship is a special kind of taking care. Beekner says that stewardship is taking care of something, some gift that has graciously been given to us that we must protect and cultivate. But stewardship doesn't simply mean taking care of something, taking care of this gift. It also means taking care with this gift. Jesus said, People do not light a lamp and put it under a bushel basket. They set it up on the stand where it can light the house. And there's a lesson about stewardship here. It's, a, it's that the lamp will be snuffed out if it's under the basket. Yes, it won't have air going to it. It won't be taken care of. But also, if we put the lamp under the basket, it won't be on the lampstand. It won't provide light to the people. It won't be something that we can take care of with. And so Jesus tells us that we must let our light shine, that we must take care of it and take care with it. Now the story of David that we heard this morning is another wonderful example of this. Oftentimes we think of David as the great king, as the warrior who killed the Philistine champion, as the shepherd. But if we attend to the story today, what you see is that the first thing that we hear about David after he's anointed by Samuel is, is that he's skillful at playing the lyre. I've seen a son of Jesse the Bethlehemite, one of Saul's courtiers says, he is skillful in playing. And yes, he's a talented young man. He has lots of talents, for sure. But what's most important here is not that he has the talents, but that he puts them to use. He used these talents in service to the king and to God, 
He came to Saul's court and played the lyre, taking care with his talents. In the same way we see in the parable of the Good Samaritan summoning someone taking care with their talents. We all know this story well. The man is beaten, robbed, left for dead on the side of the road. A priest and a Levite pass by without stopping, but a good Samaritan stops to help the man. And when he stops, what does he do? The first thing is bandages the man's wounds. When we attend carefully to this text, what we see is that the first thing that's done is not just taking care of the man, but it's taking care with the gifts for healing that he has been given. We don't know if he was a professional EMT or what, but presumably he saved this man's life on the road that day, and then provided for him further by taking him to the inn. Again, recall the words of Calvin, no task will be so sordid and base provided you're obeying your calling in it. Attending to the wounds of some stranger on the road was not something that the priest or the Levite would deign to do, but the Samaritan, the Samaritan obeyed the call. He did not begrudge the task of helping because he had the gifts to do so. It didn't matter if it was dirty or bloody work. It didn't matter that this was some stranger he didn't know. What mattered was that God had provided a talent. And so he was going to use it. Last weekend, Sister Norma told us that what she does when she welcomes people to her respite center is nothing special. She says when these people come to her, they have been walking through the desert, through the heat, that they are tired and confused. And all she says to them is, Como estas? How are you? How are you? It's such a simple thing, but people break down with joy and sorrow and pain, letting down their burdens after their long journey. It's Sister Norma's way of allowing them to heal. It's her way of bandaging their wounds with such a simple question, full of love, full of compassion. Being good stewards of our talents is both the most ordinary and extraordinary thing that we do as people of faith. It is as ordinary as putting the lamp on the lampstand, bandaging a wound, or just asking a stranger, how are you? And yet it's extraordinary, because in doing so we can help people to find their dignity. We can help build a church. We can help break down barriers between people. We can remake this world in the image of God's beloved community. Lurking in the background of both of these stories, there is a spirit of fear. Now it says in the story of Saul that the spirit of the Lord had departed him and an evil spirit came to him. The evil spirit tormented Saul because he was paranoid, we would say now. He was afraid that his kingdom would be taken from him, that someone would come in and wrestle power away from him. And he didn't want to give it up. He was afraid. And so he needed solace in the music that could take his mind away from the sphere. At the same time, David had already been anointed by Samuel. And yet there he was, in the court of Saul, risking his life every day. If Saul found out who he was, what Samuel had done, surely he would have killed him. He, he tries later. But David went in spite of the fear, because he had a talent, because he had to use it, because God called him to use it. The spirit of fear is behind the story of the Samaritan as well. Remember, 
The Samaritan stops to help someone who has been beaten and robbed. It's not a good neighborhood he finds himself in. There is fear all around. But in using those talents for healing that God had given him, the Lord is with him and protects him, just as the Lord was with David. It is up to us to prayerfully consider what God has given us, what lamps God has lit in our hearts, and put these gifts to use in spite of the fear, in spite of the darkness that crowds in. We have to resist the bushel baskets of this world that aim to snuff out the light that God shines in us. Fear, shame, selfishness, doubt. So too must we resist these broader structures of discrimination and domination, cultures of inequality and violence that threaten to suffocate the flames that God sets burning in our hearts. We must take care of the talents God gives us so that we can take care with the talents God gives us. And we do this in this house, in God's house, in this church, because this is where God's light shines the brightest, where we see the image of God's beloved community here on earth. This church can be a place for people to be stewards of their talents, to not only take care of what God has given us, the gifts of faith and service that we have, but to take care with them, to take care of one another, to take care of this community. It's a place where God's people can live not fearfully, but wonderfully, loving one another, growing together, taking care of one another with the talents we have been given. No gift is too mundane to be useful. No fear is too great to be overcome. Because by the grace of God, and in use of our talents and stewardship of them, we drive out fear and hatred from this world, so long as we are faithful and dutiful servants, stewards of the gifts God has given us. This is the promise of the gospel for us today and every day. Thanks be to God. Amen.